Good evening. I'm Tony Clark from the Carter Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of our partners at Acapella Books, I welcome you to uh, tonight's uh, presentation. We're so pleased you could join us on President Carter's 96th birthday for this very special program. Um, and one thing I should uh, note, uh, because there's going to be a lot, if not already, a lot of interest in John's book, um, and you can you can get John's book at a variety of places, but our partner Acapella Books, John has uh, provided them with a number of autographed book plates. And so you can go to acapellabooks.com and uh, get his book with a, an autographed book plate. Again, we have Jonathan Alter. He has spent the last five years working on his new book, uh, his very best Jimmy Carter, A Life. Um, he, uh, uh, this is really the first full length biography of President Carter. Uh, and, you know, he's been the, he's had three New York Times bestsellers about presidents. I expect this is going to be the, uh, the fourth one that he's had. We're, we're very fortunate tonight to have John joined in conversation with Evan Kessler, an assistant professor of history at Georgia Southwestern State University. Evan's a public historian, the author of three books, and he has spent many a Saturday night having dinner with the Carters uh, at the home of a mutual friend of theirs, uh, Jill Stuckey. So again, I apologize for the... Um, people who were um, trying to disrupt, um, but uh, we are pleased to, uh, to have you both here. Evan? Uh, your microphone is muted. And I think John, yours is as well. There we go. Thanks, Tony. And that's the, the challenge of a public global audience, right? It can people can come in from anywhere. So um, it, I'm glad I'm glad we were able to, to get going. Uh, John, I want to say from the beginning that I, I I've told you this in, in private, and I'll, I'll say it in, in public. I, I really like this book. Um, I have some some questions, <laughs> uh, some, some some sticky notes. I, we're not going to get to all of them, um, but I I want to just start off. You, know, you described. Uh, president Carter as perhaps the most misunderstood president in American history. Um, I'm curious, how did your research into Carter's life change what you knew or you thought you knew about him? Uh, well, I, I want to start off by, by thanking uh, Tony and Evan and the uh, Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and Museum for doing this. And I feel really honored that it would be done on Jimmy Carter's 96th birthday. Uh, so, and my uh, uh, birthday wishes go out to President Carter. They had a parade for him uh, today in Plains, which he, uh, you know, set out the weather was good and President and Mrs. Carter watched the parade. And I'm just so thrilled that uh, they are here uh, and, and so still so wonderful in making such an amazing contribution. Um, so I um, I had a the same uh, I think I had the same impression of Jimmy Carter as most Americans did, and it was that he had failed as president, and that you know he was a failed president and a great ex president, although he sometimes caused his successors some problems. Um, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. So, and by the way, I, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to let people who are disrupting, uh, you know, I feel bad for some of those who, who are watching, but I, I just want you to know that I'm not going to quit. And I think that civility and uh, decency and a certain tough mindedness, which is what Jimmy Carter represented, are what we need in this country. And I do believe and my latest uh, you know, soundings as a political reporter are that Joe Biden will win this election and he'll win it handily. Uh, now, he needs to win it handily. 
in order to prevent a constitutional crisis. But I just wanted to bring that up in the context of these disruptions, because we are living in a different world. There are people who wish us ill, and uh, we need to uh, be tough about it. So I just want to reiterate that, you know, I'll, I'm, not, I'm not leaving, uh, no matter what happens uh, tonight. Um, so um, what happened with me was that um, I, I was lucky enough to be in a book group in New York City, and we were reading a book about Camp David by Lawrence Wright, um, 13 Days in September. And somebody in our group knew Jason Carter, who's now the head of the Carter Center, and arranged to bring Jason and his grandfather to our book group. And, and we spent the evening with Jimmy Carter and you know, talking about Camp David and then also talking about human rights. And I realized, wow, you know, it seemed significant at the time, but there were a lot of indications that Camp David would fail. And in fact, it did fail. And this was something that I had not known. It failed, uh, the peace treaty between Israel and Egypt failed in late 1978. Carter had to go back to the Middle East and put the whole thing back together with chewing gum and bailing wire. And people continued to think it was gonna fail, but it has lasted for 42 years. It is the most successful peace treaty in the post-war era. And, it, and even though uh, a lot of people think that President Carter might be you know, too critical of Israel, too supportive of the Palestinians, a lot of Israelis feel that, American Jews feel that. The fact is, he was the greatest president for the security of the state of Israel uh, since Harry Truman, because he took the Egyptian army off the table which was the army that was, you know, poised to drive Israel into the sea. It tried on, on four occasions to drive Israel into the sea. So when I learned about just this virtuoso performance at Camp David, and then when I started to read up on how the human rights policy kicked off the democratic revolution that swept the world in the 80s and 90s, uh, and, you know, turn dozens of countries from autocracies to democracies. Now, Jimmy Carter doesn't deserve all the credit for that. But when I realized that the human rights policy was an important part of that, it, it got me really interested in maybe, you know, in starting to think that his presidency needed a reassessment. And then when I started to learn about the rest of his life, my eyes, you know, popped out because it, it's such a compelling American epic. And, and it, his life is almost like a novel in, in the ups and downs and, you know, personal challenges. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's living in, in one of the meanest counties in the South, uh, Martin Luther King called the sheriff, the, county sheriff, the uh, meanest man in the world. Meanest man. Um, and and uh, dealing with all of this and then all of what happened to him as president and a former president just got me very, very interested. And I also had a lot of running room because, as you mentioned, there had not been a biography that covered his whole life that was written by an independent historian uh, before this. So the I want to talk about the origins then of, of, of Jimmy Carter. So the, the, there's Jimmy Carter National Historic Site. And you know, one, part of its mission is to interpret Carter's life and history, and, and specifically his hometown's influence on him. On how you know, how do you make a Jimmy Carter? Um, so I'm curious, how, how did how did Carter's early experiences in archery, in plains, in Southwest Georgia, in this kind of the, one of the, the meanest areas of of the the, the Deep South, as you say, uh, how did this inspire him and or haunt him uh, throughout his life? So. Uh, Jimmy Carter was born in Plains, uh, and um, he, but when he was uh, very young, um, I think about six years old, they moved to, no, younger even, they moved to archery, which is just outside of Plains. Um, and uh, his father, Earl Carter, um, you know, bought a farm there, and they, uh, it, it was, you know, like living in the 19th century. Um, they had no running water, no electricity until uh, Carter was 11 years old and uh, no mechanized farm equipment. So he, he uh, learned how to um, you know, plow the land with a mule 
And uh, they did have a car because uh, Earl Carter was well-to-do for the community compared to other people in the area. Uh, and they had a car and a radio. Uh, but other than that, they might as well have been living in the 19th century. So I think of Carter as being the only American president who really lived effectively in three centuries, uh, you know, born uh, 96 years ago in what might as well have been the 19th, uh, obviously was connected to all of the great social movements and president of the United States in the 20th century. And the Carter Center is on the cutting edge of glo global health, uh, conflict resolution, democracy promotion, and the big issues of the 21st century. So, but the, the experience of growing up with a father who um, was um, a racist, you know, there's no way around that. Um, and a mother who took care of black patients for free and brought Jimmy to um, black churches. And then there was a third parent involved. Her name was Rachel Clark. And she was a, a farm hand on the Carter property. Her, her uh, husband uh, was the foreman and uh, she uh, signed her name with an X. And as Jimmy Carter has written and as we, we talked about, um, she, uh, she basically taught him about nature and he became the greatest environmental president since Theodore Roosevelt, which we can discuss in an unbelievably impressive environmental governor of Georgia. If you like to go uh, down to the Chattahoochee, you know, or, or uh, the Flint River, I, I, I could go on about the rivers in Georgia that he, he protected. Uh, the, a lot of that comes from Rachel Clark. And um, after his mother died, uh, Jimmy uh, said publicly that he felt like he knew Rachel Clark even better than his own mother, who was often absent during her nursing. So that combination of his father and his mother and Rachel, and then a woman named Miss Julia Coleman, who was the only school teacher ever to be referred to in an inaugural address by a president. And she uh, was the... Uh, the principal and, and the English teacher in at, at Plains High School, which actually was more than a high school. And she had an enormous influence on him. And her kind of motto was that we must uh, adapt to changing times, but hold fast to unchanging principles. And that this, this really, you know, it sounds simple, but it's, there's a complexity to that. And Carter, really hung on to that as a, almost a, a guidepost for a lot of his life. And, you know, he made plenty of mistakes and I don't sugarcoat any of them. I try to tell the full story. And I'm sure that um, some people who, uh, you know, are inclined to regard him as a, as a living saint, you know, when a historian comes along and says, well, you know, even saints uh, put their pants on to, you know, one leg at a time, uh, that might be a little bit, jarring for some of them some points of the book but um you know i i emerged from it with a an even deeper respect for jimmy carter and for his decency commitment intelligence drive uh, obviously his honesty uh, than i had when i went in I, I like your approach in the book you know as you said earlier warts and all uh i think that's it, th that sort of a book has more staying power. It's a, we, we can all pick up books that are either going to trash a, a president or, or present them as though they had no flaws whatsoever. But one of the most compelling features of any interaction with President Carter, whether it's watching him at Sunday school or an interview with him or at dinner, is how human he is. And so if you don't get that in a book, then you know, then the book has 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 failed, and 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 in, in your, your book, he is human. He has he has flaws. Um, I, I I love that you bring in Rachel Clark to this, um, and and I learned something. I learned a lot from this book. One of them was that when Carter was president, Rachel was living in public housing, and uh, and and you know, and, and Carter asked her to pray for him, and she said basically, you know. Do your best, uh, and 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 that was both touching, both in terms of the 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 long ties they had. It also spoke to the the the, the, the systematic, structural, long-term problems that affected 
the Clarks and people like the Clarks in Southwest Georgia that um, that, that the Carter um, never never faced right and 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 that gets kind of to the you know he may not have had shoes but he had the ability to own shoes right they may have been living in the 19th century but they were the landowners <laughs> yeah yes so, so uh, I wanted to just before we get off shoes I just wanted to interject one of my favorite funny stories is that his father Earl um, he believed everything had to be paid for in one way or another. And when Carter wrote his book of poems, uh, he entitled it Always a Reckoning. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, which is a deep idea. I think we're all having a reckoning on race right now in this country. But uh, part of what that referred to was his everything had to be paid for. So one year, uh, Earl Carter did a lot more than farming. He was an entrepreneur. He always had these different ideas. And he made a lot of these high button shoes that were worn at the turn of the century. You might remember them from like Mary Poppins or something, right? You know, these, these shoes from the early 1900s and they didn't sell. And so he made his kids wear them when they did wear shoes to school. Sometimes they didn't. So Jimmy had to wear, I think they sound like they were women's shoes, you know, that were like, 40 years out of date and had to wear them to school in in planes uh, <laughs> and um, but you know other times he went there proud of his father when he would uh, be uh, go hunting with him and he would show up at school with the feathers still on his on his clothes but you you know you started to raise the point it was an all white school I mean we we're talking about rigid Jim Crow segregation in this period uh, and so Jimmy would go to Americas from planes from, uh, from archery on this little train called the Butthead, and uh, with his friend AD, his, his best friend was uh, a black kid on, on the property, and they would sit separate, uh, you know, compartments of the train. And then they would get to um, the metropolis of Americas, which I don't know what, you know, maybe had you know five or ten thousand people, and um, they would walk together to the theater and then they would have to part again. And, and uh, AD would have to sit in, in the balcony. And that was the law. Then they, it wasn't until the 60s that that theater was, was integrated and, and then amid great violence uh, at the time. So, so your, the, the title of, of your book alludes to this very important moment, not only in, 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 in Carter's life, but also in your interpretation of, of Carter's life. Um, you know, and this is the, the, the famous interview, job interview uh, with Admiral uh, Hyman Rickover. Um, now, Carter was all, already fairly accomplished by 1952 or so. Uh, so, so what changed? How did this, this interview kind of set the course for the the rest of his life, not to mean that he he was he was destined to become president here, but how did that change Carter as a as a person uh, in how he approached everyday life? So Admiral Hyman Rickover was the father of the nuclear navy. Now that doesn't sound like much, but in the early 1950s, the idea of taking a nuclear power plant and putting it in a submarine when they didn't even exist on land yet was just kind of mind blowing. It was sort of like the development of the internet. It was the most exciting technological thing going on in the world at that time. And Rickover was this, uh, Carter called him the most brilliant engineer ever. Uh, and he was a naval engineer. He was also a son of a bitch, a really tough guy. And his, I, I loved learning about his interviewing. He'd do things like you tell the guy was in, he'd go open the window and it was nailed shut. He wanted to see, what his reaction was, or he'd say, uh, do something to piss me off. And the guy he let in was the guy who swept everything off his, his desk. You know, and if you, if uh, he said, break up with your girlfriend before I let you in my program, and you said, okay, he rejected you because, you know, you were too open. So there were all these booby traps and he would cut off the front legs of the, shorten the front legs of the chair so that you were falling out of the chair. Uh, and Carter had, you know, a, a slightly easier interview than that, but he got quizzed on classical music. And when he said that he liked a certain kind of classical music, you know, Rick over said, well, which movement, you know, kept boring down with these questions. And finally, he said, where'd you stand in, in your class 
uh, at Annapolis. And uh, when Carter told him, uh, you know, 59th in a, in a class of, of uh, you know, uh, 650 or something, Carter thought that was pretty good. And um, Rick over said, did you do your best? And Carter thought for a moment, he thought back to his time at the Naval Academy where he was one of the brightest students, but didn't work all that hard. And he said, well, not always. And Rick Ruiz said, why not your best? And then the interview was over. Rick over turned around his chair. And Carter thought he had been rejected, uh, but Rick over admired his honesty and he let him in. And I maintain that for the rest of his life, you know, he then titled his first book as Why Not the Best? And he, uh, when he got the Nobel Prize, uh, the, the citation referred to his always doing his best. But I, I think it, in his case, it's sort of a platitude. It was true. He was all in all the time. And the, the guy never goes on Miller time, you know. He's, he, he um, even when he's uh, uh, hunting or fishing, you know, he, he hunted until he was 94. And, and he would drive, you know, as a former president, he'd drive like, a, he and Rosalind would drive 100 miles out of their way to talk to one farmer. You know, so his whole life was you know, about this kind of ceaseless effort. And when he said his prayers, as often as 30 times a day, it was often a prayer to do his best. And I think his life is a testament to how much you can get accomplished if you if you really are, are committed to giving your all to whatever you do. And it, it created an intensity to him. I asked his son, Jeff, what, what's the one word you would use to describe your father? And he said, intense. And I think anybody who knows Jimmy Carter knows, sees that beneath that smile and that humanity, that warmth, there is an intensity and, and a, a uh, uh, often a steeliness that you don't have to know him very long to see. Yeah, and, and that's a theme of doing your best or choosing what you want to do for the rest of your life, right, is the, the key theme he has every time he teaches Sunday school. Um, and, and you see it kind of in his, in his works. There's also, I, I can't help but detect a little bit of sadness when, when I see that too, because it, 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 there's an, an interview you recorded with him five years ago, uh, and he was talking about how disappointed he was that he couldn't walk across the, the University of Emory as fast as he once could, right? That he wasn't doing enough. And I thought, if Jimmy Carter can't, be, can't find satisfaction in what he has done, then what's the hope for the rest of us? <laughs> if, if no, I, I actually don't really look at it that way. I mean, I, mean, I think that he, you know, he has a lot of drive and he wants to do everything he can. I, I think in many ways, even though he's a Baptist, in some ways he more represents the the Christian faith uh, that Rosalind was raised in Methodism to as much as you can for as many people as you can for as long as you can. And yes, he was ambitious. He's always been ambitious for himself, very self, extraordinarily self-disciplined, uh, you know, and punctual to the point of annoying people in his own family when they're be on vacation and you know, the bus would leave to go to a tourist attraction, you know, the bus would leave it at, you know, 715 and if you got there at 716 you you weren't going you know so there was a, there's a lot of that in carter um but i think that the I, I don't think that he's a sad person really at all there was a period in his life after he lost lost for governor in 1966 when he did go through a period of of, a, of depression and people around him thought that he was showing signs of depression including his his sister ruth uh and then he went through a born again experience and uh he um he went door to door as a missionary in in pennsylvania and uh, massachusetts and had amazing experiences uh he once came upon a brothel and they tried to convert the madam uh to christ that didn't quite work out uh, so then in that period then he channels his energy and his disappointment about losing into trying again running again for governor in in 1970, uh, and by this time, uh, his faith is much stronger. And I think even if you look at 
Clinton's diaries as I did, you know, very closely and also at, at, at Rosalind Carter's journals, which she was nice enough to make available to me. And she also uh, let me see uh, and use in the book uh, the love letters that he, he wrote her from the Navy, which are, are uh, you know, very interesting, a little steamy, certainly more steamy than John and Abigail Ad Adams. Anyway, you know, in this period, he, I think that he, he really does become, by the time he's governor, he really does know who he is. And even at the depth of his presidency, he writes in his diary that, you know, people around me are, are, are freaking out, you know, and, and really upset. And I don't know why, but I'm not, I'm not really that upset. I'm okay. Uh, and even, you know, after the Democratic convention in 1980, and he, he reads the press clips and he says that, you know, they made me sound like a combination of Hitler and Goofy, uh, even when he's really getting, you know, hit hard. Uh, and even when he loses to Reagan, I, I don't think he really ever really sinks into a depression. And I think in his post-presidency, there was a period of adjustment in 1981 and 82, but once he got the Carter Center going and they started to do these terrific things, I don't think he he has ever really, you know, I mean, he can be snappish, whatever, he can have his moments, but I don't think he's ever been sad. I could be wrong. I think it's the one thing you learn, Evan, in writing a biography is, you know, as William James said, that nobody can go inside another person's heart. You can, I could have studied him for 500 years and I could never be definitive about Jimmy Carter or any other person. And I just did my own very best to get as close as I could and talk to more than 250 people who've known him, everybody in his family and him, and to try to paint as rounded a picture as I could because what kept me fascinated, and I hope keeps readers interested, is that he's enormously complex, and he has all of these layers to him. And and he's also, for me, he was kind of, you know, I was at the Carter Library when, when Trump came down the escalator and announced his candidacy, and then I had to go over to MSN Studio in Atlanta to talk on MSNBC about him. And when I got back to the library, I realized, wow, what a relief. Like, the Carter papers are like, you know, brushing away the toxicity. And so what I hope is that my book can be kind of comfort food for the body politic. Like you, you feel more hopeful and, and just feel that there is decency left in our world. Uh, even if somebody has a lot of political problems, the way Carter or Harry Truman or John Adams or a number of other presidents did, that you, you still can, our country is better than what we're going through now. Did, did he, Carter have a, a political role model or, or, or multiple? Uh, or is, is he just, is he too, too unique for that? Um, I, I think so. Uh, he was very interested in Truman. You know, he's such a curious person. Like he wanted to go to Henry Wallace, uh, who was a, a progressive candidate for president, former vice president in 1948. He wanted to go to a rally and he was told that would cause him problems in the Navy. But I think he was really impressed by Truman's desegregation of the armed forces. And he, he really liked Harry Truman. He's his favorite president. And he put Truman signed the buck stops here on his desk when he became president. And, and I think there are a lot of Truman comparisons that are legitimate, not the least of which is that Truman left office very unpopular. And it was 35 years before David McCullough wrote a book that began to restore his his reputation but he he saw he liked john kennedy a lot in the early 60s and a lot of people thought including time magazine that he looked like kennedy actually rose kennedy commented at one point that she thought the governor of georgia looked a little bit like her her son uh and so kennedy was a little bit of a role model but um i don't think he really had one in Georgia politics as such. Um, and because he really wasn't, in many ways, he wasn't a, a politician. He didn't see him, he never really saw himself as a politician. And this caused him problems. Uh, it, you know, Rosalind was more political than, than Jimmy was. It, to tell, tell us a little bit about uh, how, how the Steel Magnolia, how, how Rosalind uh, plays into uh, Carter's life. I, 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 I 
will publicly say that I hope that one day Jimmy Carter National Historic Site is Jimmy and Rosalind Carter National Historic Site because um, I don't think you have Jimmy Carter without with, without without Rosalind. So so t tell tell us how, uh, how how she fits in to Carter's political ambitions. Um, so uh, they actually met um, uh, ninety uh, three years ago uh, when uh, Rosalind was delivered by Miss Lillian, Jimmy's mother, it was a nurse, small town. Uh, and Jimmy was actually born in the ho in a hospital. He's the first American president born in a hospital. They had a small hospital in Plains in those days. And Rosalind uh, was uh, delivered by uh, Miss Lily, and then then she brought her three year old over to see the new baby. But they didn't see each other much for many years. Rosalind was friends with uh, Jimmy's uh, sister uh, uh, Ruth, and. Then when uh, Jimmy was in the Navy, Rosalind kind of mooned over the picture of him in uniform and they started dating and fell in love and got, got married uh, in 1946. And she was very eager to get out of Plains and really upset with Jimmy when he came back to Plains after his father died uh, in, uh, in, in 1953. And, um, but she then helped him build the Carter's Warehouse, their very successful agribusiness. She was intimately involved in that. And uh, she was his closest advisor, remains his closest advisor. So they have one of the most extraordinary relationships uh, really in the, the history of American presidency. And she, uh, many firsts as first lady, basically the two of them revolutionized the position of first lady. She did much more than even Eleanor Roosevelt had done, not just sitting in on cabinet meetings, which was well known, but being, uh, she, you know, she drove uh, legislation on mental health. She and, and the wife of the Senator, Betty Bumpers, basically got the whole country to immunize uh, kids before they entered school. The list goes on and on of what she accomplished. But when he would say, uh, I want my uh, advisors get, uh, and say to, Susan Clow is secretary or something, you know, I get, get Rosalind, uh, Cy, you know, Zvig, Harold, Hamilton, Hugh Siding in Time Magazine said, note the order hmm. of, of the people advising the president. Uh, and she is a formidable woman and a wonderful woman. And where he, you know, would be unpopular with certain people, she never was. I, 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 I have never met a person who had a critical word to say about her. Uh, just enormously impressive person. So I, I want to go back to something you said about Carter running as a, or never seeing himself as a politician, right? He, he, he runs as an outsider and in many ways, governs as an outsider and as a post president is also sort of a, an outsider to, to the ex residents. <laughs> um, I, I, I was talking to a, a friend, Robert Green, who teaches at uh, Clayton University uh, in, in South Carolina. And, and he, he, he and I were talking about the, the, the Car Carter and, and the Democrats in, uh, in the 70s. And, and, I, and I pulled the numbers from your book, but the Democrats controlled 149 more seats than Republicans in 1977, and they had 58 seats in the Senate. Um, so, but Carter didn't have a very easy career with the Democratic Party. So, so what was the problem, and uh, or, or or how could his relationship with the the Democrats, the rest of his own party, have been better? So, American politics was really different then. Um, each party had two wings: there were liberal Republicans conservative Republicans, liberal Democrats, conservative Democrats. And there were a number of bills where uh, Carter lost a lot of Democrats and only got the bill passed with the help of liberal Republicans. He had to put together a new coalition on each bill. But, uh, and he had a lot of trouble with Congress and he had a lot of trouble inside the Democratic Party. And when I asked him what his biggest regrets were about his presidency, he talked about not tending enough to relationships and to issues inside the party because when ted kennedy challenged him for the nomination in 1980 that was very harmful i mean it didn't single-handedly 
cost of reelection, but in combination with the hostages not coming back and the dismal economy, uh, which he had already moved to fix. You know, he appointed Paul Volcker, who ended inflation. I argue that Volcker actually elected Reagan twice. And when I asked Volcker this not long before he died and I interviewed him, he said, yeah, there's, there's something to that because he jacked up interest rates to 15%. Imagine if in, in October of 1980, imagine if right now interest rates were at 15%, what that would do to Trump, right? Yeah. You know, nobody could borrow any money to start a business. And but what that did was it ended inflation, but not until Reagan was president. So then when Reagan comes in, you know, it works. Reagan gets reelected because of Volcker, who was appointed by Carter. Anyway, to the, the question, he, he sometimes mismanaged these relationships, especially his relationship with Ted Kennedy. There was enough blame to go around. But the bottom line, I think, has been misunderstood for all of these years because, remember, uh, Carter was the first Democratic president after LBJ. He, and so everybody expected there to be a lot of legislation. And there was. He signed dozens and dozens of bills, 14 major pieces of environmental legislation, more bills than any president, excluding LBJ, since Roosevelt. Hmm. Carter is number two since Roosevelt in points on the board because he did, the Democratic Congress did help him eventually, even despite what I just said, that, you know, that he did have the votes for not party line votes, but, you know, he had a significant amount of support. He had a Democratic Congress for four years, Clinton and Obama for only two years. So he got through all of these bills and we could talk all night about things that he did that changed the country that nobody remembers, like, say, the Community Reinvestment Act of 1978. It curbed redlining. Right. Uh, this is a big thing or a bill that nobody paid attention to that let public utilities use renewable energy before that they couldn't do that. They weren't incentivized to do that. And, and you know, preserving more uh, wilderness uh, than doubling the size of the National Park Service with 100 million acres protected in Alaska. And it doesn't matter kind of what issue we talk about. He was getting things done despite his problems with Congress. And the tragic thing, Evan, is that at the very end of his presidency, Carter was a planner. He had actually been a land use planner in Georgia and founded a, a planning commission in Southwest Georgia and served on several planning boards. And so he set up this sustainability plan called Global 2000 about what we needed to do to preserve, uh, plan for the turn of the century. 20 years down the road. And uh, one of the, every recommendation that he got, he turned it into either executive orders or laws. The last one he got was to take action on what was then called carbon pollution, uh, global warming. And so if Jimmy Carter had been reelected in 1980, he would have been addressing climate change in the early 1980s. Think about that. Think about the tragic implications of that, of that election. And and something else you mentioned in the book is his uh, his uh, mileage standards for cars, right? The plan was to have what forty eight, the average, the standard be forty eight miles per gallon by ninety five or the late nineties. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he introduced the first ones and he got them through. You know, Detroit. He had a showdown with with the automakers in the Roosevelt Room of the White House, and he said, "Look, you guys are going to just have to have to have fuel economy standards. They hadn't had them before." Um, so there's so many things like that. Uh, so it's, it sounds like, I mean, at, at, at times he could be a, he could be a fierce leader, right? He, he could, when, when, uh, when he, when he chose something, there, are there, what are there big pieces of legislation that he, he failed on in his time? Or was it that he just didn't have the, 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 the second term to kind of fill out the rest of his, his program? As you say, he was a planner, right? He had all these these expectations for, for uh, what he so so he was able to get through what he wanted to get through. It sounds like no, no, there were there were three or four big things that he was not able to get through, um, and it was a com some of it was his fault, some of it was the fault of other people. You know, he wanted tax reform. He thought the tax code was a disgrace to the human race. I think he called it during the 
76 campaign. And he made a mistake by not consulting with Russell Long, who was the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, Al Allman, House Ways and Means Committee, to kind of grease the skids for the legislation. And he thought he would just kind of drop it in their laps. And because it was the right thing to do, uh, it would pass. And he, so in, in a sense, he didn't, he thought that the power of his argument, and this is a problem that I think engineers experience, why not very many engineers become CEOs? They sometimes fall just short of becoming CEO. They're so brilliant, but they think that the power of the idea, once they diagnose the problem and the solution, that other people will see it as they do on the merits, and they, they kind of underestimate the com complex politics. So he lost on tax reform, and it was just at the beginning of that tax cutting fever, and uh, and he uh, he lost narrowly on creating a new Department of Consumer Protection. He did it, you know, create the Department of Energy, the Department of Education. FEMA was created under Carter, uh, but he, he lost. He was a fantastic president for consumers, but it was all what people were doing in the agencies, and a lot of it could be reversed by mm -hmm. uh, by Reagan. So he didn't get that legislation through to institutionalize it. And most important, he, he lost on health care. And that goes to this very tangled, to me, fascinating relationship between Carter and Kennedy. And there was enough blame to go around in them not getting uh, health care. But that's one of the stories that I tell in the book. But there's so many other things in so many other areas. I mean, and we, uh, we haven't even started talking about foreign policy, but just like the revitalization of the cities, these were done through eventually over the last 40 years through what are called public-private partnerships. And those began with uh, urban development action grants and other things that Carter uh, did. And even though um, his uh, what, another bill that failed was a welfare reform proposal, it failed. But Carter came up with this idea amid that uh, called the Earned Income Tax Credit, which was actually picked up by Reagan. He introduced it as a kind of pilot program. Clinton and Obama dramatically expanded it. It's now the most successful anti-poverty program uh, that we have, other, really other than Social Security and, and Medicaid. It, it gives the, wor the working poor an, enough money to get into the middle class, you know, several thousand dollars a year if you're making, you know, under Thirty-five thousand dollars. It's it's a really important program. It has a really boring name, the Earned Income Tax Credit. So there's a lot of these things that are kind of policy things. I don't get into them too much in the book because it's a, a narrative, and as I said, his his life is novelistic. But but when you pause to look at the policy, the presidency really looks a lot better, especially when you turn to foreign policy. Speaking of foreign policy, right? You mean you, you work in China, in in Panama, or of course the big one is uh, the uh, Camp David uh, Accords. Uh, I have a question, kind of uh, that to parallel us with the, with with the present, right? There's you know this this new agreements with the UAE, Bahrain, and uh, and Israel, right? Is it are are these comparable? Are these, uh, it, it, or, you know, with, with what Carter was doing in in the '70s, or is this even? We're talking about two entirely different different sports here. Well, they're not different sports, and I think the UAE Israel deal is is a good deal, as, as Carter himself does, uh, in part because it dissuades uh, Israel from annexation in the West Bank. But you know, the UAE and Israel have had relations really for years they just haven't been diplomatic relations and they didn't fight four wars like israel and egypt you know and the uae doesn't have a huge army the you know a huge army that the power to destroy israel so it was kind of like a, a pimple on the back of camp david next to camp david and it doesn't really deserve to be uh, in the same sentence uh as camp david uh and you know i mentioned human rights earlier so one day after carter was president, uh, and he was starting to teach at Emory, and he was walking across the campus, and he was with uh, Jim Laney, the president of Emory, and later ambassador to South Korea, and they ran, ran into a guy named Carl Deutsch, Professor Carl Deutsch, a Harvard, very distinguished Harvard professor, one of the top experts on international relations in, in the United States, and he uh, says to Carter, you know, a thousand years from now, 
um, this story comes from Laney, not from Carter. A thousand years from now, uh, there are very few American presidents who will be remembered. You will be because of your human rights policy. It was the first time that a major power had ever had a foreign policy that cared about the way a country treated its own people and made that uh, a condition for aid and other things. Now, it was a hypocritical policy in many ways. It was in the middle of the Cold War. So, you know, Carter had to cozy up for a while to the Shah of Iran and Marcos in the Philippines, uh, but especially in the Western Hemisphere and 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 uh, behind the Iron Curtain, you know, this gave great comfort to dissidents. People like Vasco of Havel mm -hmm. praised it. And a lot of uh, conservative Republicans like Lawrence Silverberger, who later became Secretary of State, they said that this had this policy had a lot to do with ending the Cold War. But most of it, most important, it set a new global standard about how we treat each other, which is so consistent with with Carter's whole life. And uh, and I think even he devalued it, you know, because after the invasion of Afghanistan, he couldn't really stress it. Uh, very much toward the end of his presidency, and and we created a new uh, uh, assistant secretary for human rights. It was run by this wonderful woman named Patricia Darian, and she was disappointed about what was happening at the end of the administration, and so it looked like the policy was kind of a failure. And right now, it's it's under assault, and you know they haven't even Trump didn't even fill the position of assistant secretary human rights who wanted to with a torturer and then you had to back off that. Uh, but if Biden is elected, one of the first things he'll do is to revive our human rights policy. And George W. Bush was the, cent the centerpiece of his foreign policy. It was a continuation of a human rights policy. Reagan, even though he criticized the human rights policy when he was running, he maintained it. I interviewed Elliot Abrams about this. They maintained it. Uh, in most parts of the world after Reagan came in. So this was a huge deal. Open, uh, the, recognizing China was a huge deal. China had the GDP of Sub-Saharan Sub Africa at that time. And when Deng Xiaoping and Jimmy Carter got together, they basically, the bilateral relationship that they established is the foundation of the global economy. And China, we know, does a lot of things wrong. We have a lot of issues with them. But this has been hugely important in everything that's happened in, in all of our economic lives in the 40 years since then. But because it was Nixon who opened the door in 72, no one walked through the door and, and actually established the relationship, embassies and, you know, there was a great story at, at one point after they established relations, the uh, uh, science advisor was in China and uh, Carter's awakened at 3 a.m. And it's Frank Press, the science advisor, who's with Deng Xiaoping. And he says, uh, you know, he wants to send, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think it was uh, uh, 3,000 students to the United States so that they can study in the United States. And Carter's kind of annoyed, uh, woken in the middle of the night. And the way he tells the story, he says, you know, he kind of says, let him send 100,000. You know, let them 10,000. Let them send 10,000. So now they, and he's hangs up the phone. They send 250,000 Chinese students. They're like keeping a lot of our colleges afloat. And, and, and they're also creating some level of understanding that can be useful in preventing uh, hostilities. And then the last thing on foreign policy that is often overlooked is the Panama Canal Treaties, which were a super heavy lift getting those through. They had to pass by a two thirds vote and two thirds of the country, thanks to Ronald Reagan, was against ratification. So imagine that two thirds of the country is against it. You need two thirds to get it approved. Carter got it done. They lost five senators over it, but the Joint Chiefs of Staff said it prevented sending more than 100,000 troops. We would have had a war in Central America, it would have been a Vietnam in Central America. It totally transformed our relations, not just in Central America, but in South America. And that whole gringo go home thing 
kind of ended after we gave back the Panama Canal. The Panamanians did a great job of maintaining the canal. So when things go right, a lot of times, you know, the person who makes them go right doesn't get credit. It's not like I go, I give short shrift to Iran and the Iranian hostage crisis. It's a great story and I tell it in full. But I, I think that the, you know, these other uh, parts of this record are, are less appreciated. Well, out out of respect for your time, we haven't even gotten to the, the post presidency. Uh, but I know that um, that uh, Tony ha might have some questions from the audience. Right, you were just talking about uh, human rights, and and one of the questions was about the International Criminal Criminal uh, Tribunal, and whether President Carter, as a at that point post president, was involved in any way. Um, in human rights work in Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, Serbia. Yes, uh, in 1994, he, had a, he engineered a ceasefire there. Uh, and it was, unfortunately, it didn't hold. But it was one of three achievements in 1994. Uh, he arguably prevented two wars that year. Um, in Haiti, where he, uh, Colin Powell and Sam Nunn, went to Haiti when U.S. warships were just offshore, and uh, they got uh, Cedrus, General Cedrus, to leave power in Haiti. Um, then he, he, he ticked off uh, President Clinton by going on CNN before he reported to him. So he had a very fraught relationship with Bill Clinton. Not a lot of, uh, even though Clinton gave him the Presidential Medal of Freedom eventually, very difficult, complex relationship that goes back to 1980 and the Mariel boat lift, and that's a whole other story. But then in North Korea, he goes and he uh, he sees uh, the founder of North Korea, who's uh, uh, not long, far from back, uh, Kim Il-sung, and, and he, um, he basically prevents uh, a war in North Korea. Uh, and and then, then he also, you know, sins by uh, going on CNN before <laughs> reporting to Clinton. It happened twice that year in 94. Uh, and so he got, you know, some bad publicity out of both Haiti and North Korea, even though the results were good. Now, some Republicans say, well, you know, that that uh, treaty uh, didn't uh, last with North Korea and we should have bombed that reactor at the time, like some people in the Clinton administration wanted to do. Well, they would have just rebuilt it. That wouldn't have done any good. And you know, Carter, um, he would do anything he could. And and you mentioned Jill Stuckey before, our mutual friend who lives in Plains and who you and I have both had dinner with, with, with the Carters. And, you know, she got it exactly right when she said he doesn't care what people think of him as long as he's trying to keep the bullets from flying. He doesn't care who he, he, he doesn't like the way he operates. He wants to keep peace. And peace is so central. It's a thread that runs through his whole life. And, and uh, I think he, he is uh, at, his, at his most vital when he is trying to stop uh, uh, fighting. And it, sometimes it gets in the way of human rights because he will go and sit with dictators and some people in the human rights community don't like the fact that he will you know, spend time with dictators. And, you know, his argument on that is, look, it's easy to talk to your friends. The hard thing is to talk to, the, to the, your enemies. And it's the dictators who have the weapons that can kill people. So, of course, I'm going to talk to the dictators and try to keep them from killing people. Yeah, that reminds me of the Walter Mondale quote, uh, we told the truth, we obeyed the law, we kept the peace. Those were the important things for the, uh, the administration. Right. Um, one of the questions uh, deals with, with race. When he is running against Governor Sanders, yeah. um, initially, he looks like he's to the right of Governor Sanders. Uh, and then, uh, in fact, I think there's a quote about, you may not like how I run for governor, but you'll like the way I govern. Well, um, so that was not his finest hour. And I have a whole chapter about that. Um, you know, a chapter's called the code word campaign. He was running to the right of former Governor Carl Sanders. 
And uh, he was not saying racist things, but he was appealing to racists. Jimmy Carter was uh, to get elected because his constituency was the rural vote. Sanders had Atlanta. And to get that vote, you know, he could not denounce the segregationists. Uh, and he said to me at one point, I, I could have denounced them and then I wouldn't have been in politics. So, you know, this was a very tough choice that he made. But he saw Vernon Jordan during the campaign and he said, uh, watch what I do when I get there, not what I am saying now. And so he actually went and he paid a call on the co-founder of the White Citizens Council, former uh, Governor uh, Marvin Griffin, who was a, a segregationist. And then, then what, it's just this amazing story. So the whole time Carter knows the right thing to do, but for 18 years to make it in politics and to live in that community for his business interests, uh, he, he, he quit even though people in town knew that he was a liberal he really felt he couldn't speak out and when somebody did when somebody did not boycott another business in america did not boycott this interracial farm koinonia near near plains they dynamited his business so having said that carter could have shown more guts earlier on and there's a lesson in this for all of us because we have been silent about racial injustice. I think we're all having a reckoning post George Floyd this year. And what Carter, I, I argue, did is he spent the second half of his life making up for not being part of the civil rights movement. And he said recently after George Floyd that, you know, he issued a statement that he's learned in his travels around the world that silence equals violence. Uh, and But he was silent no more when he became governor. And there's this great story about it. he had this pilot, this wonderful eccentric guy named David Rabhan, <laughs> going around in Cessna. And on the last day of the campaign, where it's clear that Carter's going to be the next governor, he says, David, you've done so much for me. What, what can I do for you? And David writes on an aerial map, the time for racial discrimination is over. Sign this and say it in your inaugural. Carter signed it. And he said it in his inaugural. Now, it might not seem like that much now. The time for racial discrimination is over. This was huge in 1971 in Georgia. And, and uh, the, many of the whites in the audience felt betrayed. There was a walkout, which I learned for the first time. It hadn't been reported at the time. But former state senator Bobby Rowan told me about this. A number of white state senators, walked, they turned their backs on Carter after he said this. They walked out. Later, they told Rowan that end loving bastard betrayed us. Meanwhile, the black Georgians in the audience, uh, as Rita Samuels, uh, the late Rita Samuels, who was became a senior aide to Carter, as she told me, you know, we were saying, he said, what? He said, what? The time for racial discrimination is over? And then, of course, he puts up Martin Luther King's picture in the Capitol. He integrates Georgia state government. He appoints black judges. And then as president, he appoints a lot of black judges and as many women judges as all of his predecessors combined times five. And he appointed more judges total, though none to the Supreme Court, than Donald Trump has, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who he plucked from obscurity to put on the federal bench. Uh, and she said, you know, I love this line from Ginsburg. She said, you know, did you, uh, when did you know you wanted to be a judge? And she said, I didn't know I wanted to be a judge or could be a judge until Jimmy Carter decided that half the human race had something to contribute. Uh, and she said he, uh, he uh, remade the complexion of the federal bench. And that is very true. And I think a lot of that and a lot of the work he's done in his post-presidency, where he's a hero in Africa for a lot of reasons, uh, um, a lot of that comes out of this. He's driven not just by his faith, but by this sense that he has this authority and he is going to use it for the betterment of the world. And I think some of that has to be powered uh, by what he told me was his quote, you know, late awareness on, uh, on, on segregation. He, he, he was against it, but he wasn't aware of just how insidious and wicked it was. Um, one other thing, Hamilton Jordan gets a lot of credit for his long memo about how do you become president. 
Yeah. Could she have become president without the help of Hamilton? No, no. Hamilton Jordan uh, was a political genius, and he, you know, he rubbed some people the wrong way in Washington. He didn't like the niceties of Georgetown society, and arguably Carter might have gotten more done if he'd, uh, you know, gone to Catherine Graham's house for dinner more. Uh, and Jordan, I think himself, and I just, I, I, he had died by the time I started writing the book, but I became very friendly with Hamilton uh, about 15 years ago uh, because uh, he called me when he heard that I had lymphoma and he had one of the four different cancers Hamilton had was lymphoma. And so he reached out to me and we really connected. And uh, I, in reading his brilliant memos, um, I, I don't think that Carter would have come out of nowhere from 0% to the Democratic nomination without Hamilton Jordan and, I, and, and Carter would say the same thing. One last thing, Jonathan. Yep. How would you, in a sentence or so, describe Jimmy Carter, what he, what he is, what he, if someone didn't know him, is there a, what's your word picture of him? Well, um, you know, I, I, I asked uh, his children for this, and um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, Jeff said intense, uh, but um, uh, Amy described him as, you know, when you are talking to him, and I think a lot of people have noticed this, you have his full attention. He is fully, he is a fully present individual. So I think we know the other things that he's, decent and extraordinarily intelligent and honest and uh, steely uh, um, beneath the smile there is steel. Uh, Rosalind isn't uh, the only one with steel in her. Um, but um, I think that the, um, you know, I'm not doing a very good job uh, you know, reducing 670 pages to one sentence. I can do that with his presidency. So the, way, the one sentence I use about his presidency is that he was a political and stylistic failure, but a substantive and far-sighted, even visionary success. If you look at his record, uh, and but as as a person, I, I think that um, he um, uh, you have to say that he is. Uh, a, a driven person, uh, but he does so with a, a big heart. And when he sometimes likes humanity more than individual human beings, which is fair to say about him, because he can be very tough-minded, a very touch, tough judge of people, he then prays to do better uh, and prays for you know, what Lincoln called the, the better angels of his nature. And his nature has a lot of those better angels. Well, with that, I think uh, that's a good description. And I think we all are probably encouraged to, to get Jonathan's book to read more uh, about the full life of, of uh, President Carter. Those of us that have been fortunate enough to be around him know um, just the kind of pride just being around him uh gives it so jonathan alter evan thank you both very much again i apologize to both of you and to our audience for the uh, the incivility earlier tonight but uh i appreciate you all sticking with us uh, again uh acapella books if you go to acapellabooks.com they have copies of uh of Jonathan's book uh, with uh, autographed book plates. So I would encourage you to uh, to get those as well. And, so and thank the, you. The audio book is available as well uh, um, from Audible. And, you know, there are a lot of ways to experience the book. And That's a, great. A guy named Michael Bolton, a wonderful actor, read performed the book. He did a magnificent job doing it on the audio book. So I wanted to get that in for Michael. Absolutely. And thank you, Jonathan, for working with our archivist so much. Jonathan has, for those of you who don't know, he has spent many an hour over with our, our archivists at the Carter Presidential Library. And they all say he has been a pleasure to work with. And I've known Jonathan for a while while he's there. And he is indeed a pleasure to uh, 
to be around, to work with, and to read. Tony, can I just, because I might not have done it enough at the beginning before the interruption, I mean, the help that I got from the Carter Library and the Carter Center uh, was invaluable. Uh, and there are too many people to thank, uh, but uh, I, I want to single out one person uh, in particular, Steve Hockman, who was available to me over and over again. But there were many archivists and and uh, staff people at at the at both both institutions. And I couldn't have done the book without them. Great. Well, thank you. And and everybody should get a chance to get a get a copy of his book so that you can see the great work he did uh, uh, and the the great life President uh, Jimmy Carter has lived. So thank you all very much for being with us tonight. Thank you.